Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here this morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. You should find it on page 457 of the Bible that you were given on your way in, if you were given one. 457. I'll read it out for us, but first let me pray and let me ask God for his help as we study his word together. So Father, as we read and meditate on your word this morning, our prayer is that you would show us Christ, show us his love, show us his forgiveness, and feed us his words in order that we might love you, obey you, and sing to others of your goodness and glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 22 reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have answered me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, Glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. 
prosperity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Amen. Well, please keep those words open for you as we look at them together. This morning, we're listening to the last words of a forsaken king facing his own death. Throughout history, we'd be able to read of monarchies that have been abolished by the people, kings that were cast aside as the rightful ruler was rejected by his people. And here this morning in Psalm 22, we hear the words of not just one king, but two kings, born around a thousand years apart from one another. We hear the words of King David, a king who was deserted, derided, defeated, staring at the reality of his own suffering and death. But as we've seen so far in the Psalms, King David's words describe situations which foreshadow the experiences of King Jesus, born 1,000 years later, as King Jesus too is deserted, derided, defeated, stares down at the people who have nailed him to the cross. See, the tragedy of Psalm 22 is that in rebelling against King David, in rebelling against King Jesus, the people are rebelling against the king that God has given them to rule over them. This is not the rejection of a king who is a tyrant. This is the rejection of God's good king, a denial of his rule over them as his people. Not only that, but in verse one, both King David and King Jesus cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's as if King David writes the prayers that the eternal King Jesus will pray on the cross. 1,000 years later. And so God's king appears to be forsaken by both his people and by God the Father. There is so much at stake here in Psalm 22. As the king faces all of these things, how will he conduct himself? What will his suffering reveal about his understanding and his faith in God the Father? What will become of his people, those who have trusted the king, those who have continued to trust in the king? Are they too forsaken by the Lord? Will God's good king triumph over evil as God promised that he would? Will God's good promises of salvation for his king, salvation for his people, will they triumph over evil just as God said that they would? As we sit beside King David this morning, as we sit at the foot of the cross, It's hard for us to watch. It's perhaps even harder for us to listen to the words of the king. Why are you so far from saving me, he says. I cry, but you do not answer. I cry, but I find no rest. Well, the psalm splits into two halves. In the first half, we hear the cries of God's king, deserted, derided, defeated, And that's the first thing that we'll look at this morning. We read in verses one and two that God's king is forsaken by God the Father. You might be able to call to mind a scene from a film, perhaps like Cast Away or something similar, a rescue from a desert island, a rescue from an ocean situation where a plane at one point flies overhead or a ship sails across the horizon. But despite the attempts of the people who are stranded, despite the cries of the people for rescue, it seems so hopelessly far off, and their pleas seem to go utterly ignored. And so from a human perspective, both King David and both King David and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God the Father seems to be far off from saving him, far from his pleas which we read, pleas which go unheeded, pleas which go without an answer, and so the king goes without rest. From a human perspective, that sense of God's love and care is gone. And then in verse 6, so distorted and so marred by his experiences, the king regards himself more like a worm and not a man. 
Onlookers really twist the verbal knife, verses 7 and 8, declaring with scorn and with mockery, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. The very people that the king came to serve, to love, to forgive. The people that the king created are the people that stare at him with contempt. Thirdly then, in verse 12, many strong bulls of Bashan encompass and surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. 3,000 years ago, Bashan is a foreign nation, a powerful enemy of God's people, and they're so close to the king, so close to defeating the king, moving in closer and closer to where he is. And it seems like there is nowhere for the king to turn. Deserted by his God, derided by mankind, defeated seemingly by his enemies. And so verse 14, the king is poured out like water. All of his bones are out of joint. The fierce heart of the warrior king of God's people is like wax melted within his breast. His strength is gone, verse 15. His tongue sticks to his jaws. He says, you lay me in the dust of death. I can count all my bones, verse 17. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots as the people share the spoils of the defeat of God's king. It's a desperate picture for King David. It's a desperate picture for King Jesus. The smile of God the Father, the love and the praise of the people, the light of the law of the Lord shining out to the nations. All of these things seem to have completely disappeared. And as we read in Mark just there, these are the genuine experiences of King Jesus as he goes to a cross at the hands of the Roman and religious authorities 2,000 years ago. And I wonder if, because we know what happens three days later as Jesus gloriously rises again to victory over sin and death, I wonder if, therefore, I'm slightly too quick to go from Good Friday to Easter Sunday in my head and in my heart. And I wonder if this account of Jesus' death on the cross, written 1,000 years beforehand, not only clearly shows that all of this is still happening within God's sovereign control, not only showing us that all of these things so very clearly happen within God's salvation plan, even the pursuit, even the persecution of the king, not only does it show us God's control and power, but Psalm 22 causes us to slow down and ponder just exactly what it was that King Jesus went through for us, for his own glory. See, Psalm 22 deepens my appreciation for the pain that Jesus suffered as the Son of God incarnate, truly God experiencing something as a full human being that would have been so very alien to him. The sins of his people placed on him, the wrath of the Father poured out on him. And as our King takes all these things on himself as a man in my place and in your place. His words are, my God, my God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? See, Psalm 22 floods me with fresh impetus to abhor the sin in my life that led to him being treated the way that he was treated in these verses, in a way that he ought never to have been treated. Psalm 22 deepens my love and my gratitude for what King Jesus did for me and did for his people on the cross. And it also reminds me that at times in the life of God's people, the salvation that God the Father promises can seem far off, can't it? The range of emotions that the King of God's people feels is the same range of emotions that we will feel at times even if his experiences and ours are different to one another. See, as Cody prayed earlier on, I think we can look at God's salvation plan and sense from time to time that we too might be forsaken. And what these verses show us is that those moments are permissible as his people, especially when we hear the derision, the mockery, the scorn of the crowds and when the enemies of God's kingdom pressed near to us, to our hearts, to our lives. However, following the example of our King Jesus, Psalm 22 shows us that things aren't always what they seem. 
even in our darkest moments. When it seems like God has forsaken us, it doesn't do us any good to turn away from him and hide. Instead, listen to what our king does in response to his situation. As we read the psalm out earlier on, you might have heard the repetition of the word trust in these verses. Well, who is the object of the king's trust? Read with me verse 4. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. Verse 5. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And then again in verse 9. You are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. See, the king in his perilous circumstances, with his life on the line, with his kingdom on the line, still trusts in the salvation of God the Father. And it's a trust that refuses to allow what he sees and what he hears and what he feels and what he experiences around him. It's a refusal to allow all of that to, or any of that, to override the truth and the reality of God the Father who has shown his king his faithful care and his provision ever since the king was born as a boy and before and after. These words here from Jesus are an incredible testimony of the faith of our king as he hangs on the cross for our sins. He felt the full measure, imaginable, unimaginable, of both our sin and the wrath of God on our behalf. Our truly human representative standing in our place, forsaken by God, forsaken by mankind, and not once did his trust in the Lord waver. Here is the king who is prepared to selflessly suffer, not one who is interested in his own gain, but one who is truly for the people for whom he fights. Here is the king who trusts in God despite his dire and deadly surroundings. Here is the king who remains resolutely righteous, totally trustworthy, forever faithful towards God the Father. Here is the king who is worthy of our trust. Here is the king who is worthy of our fealty. Here is the king who knows that even in those moments, even when God the Father seems, feels far away, his trust is locked onto the Lord, his character, his words. It's the safest and best possible place for the king to place his confidence. And we can be so very, very thankful, I think, to the Lord, to Jesus, to our king, that when we might wobble and waver in our faith, the king who represented us on the cross the king who represents us still to this day never saw his trust wobble or waver once. There is room within a total trust in God's salvation. There is room within a total trust in God's providence for the king to cry, why have you forsaken me? To express his confidence in God's undeniable and insurmountable plan to powerfully rescue and to save shortly afterwards. It does mean that when God's promises seem to hang by a thread, our trust in his word, our trust in his rescue, need not waver, should not waver. I think it's easy for me, easy for us perhaps, as the followers of the king, to feel that spiritual uncertainty in our hearts as we look around about us, to begin to glance to the right, to the left, to see if there's a more reliable looking option, something else. Something that maybe we can just add on to the good word and good work of God the Father. Something that we just might reach out to for better safety, better security. And yet King Jesus would say there is no such thing. Our King's example here would be to hold on to the salvation of the Lord with both hands. Even in moments of perceived desertion, derision, defeat, doubt. And death. See, we can look back throughout God's word time and time again, as often as you like, to see that God has not been far off. He has never been far off, even if he has seemed so. 
And those examples push us and prompt us to follow our king's example and to trust in God's salvation. So how do we respond to this? Well, with our remaining time, let's now turn to the second half of our psalm. Verses 20 and 21. Let me read out how they literally read. Verse 20 and 21 reads, Deliver me from the sword. Deliver my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And then just very simply the words, You have answered me. It's a very deliberate echo of verse 2, except inverted wonderfully. The king knows that his bleak circumstances are not the end of the story. We go from God perceivably not answering to then in verse 21, a certainty from the king that God has and will answer his cries. Why is that the case? How can the king be so confident? Well, verse 24. God the Father, our Lord, has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. As the king bore our sins on our behalf, God the Father looked on the Son, looked on the sacrifice of the Son and did not despise or abhor Jesus, did not hide his face from him, but heard Jesus, accepted his sacrifice on the cross. The work was finished, as we'll shortly sing, and raised him to eternal life days later. But that moment on the cross, that moment in history, was the moment where God the Father really did pour his wrath on the sin of humanity and also continue to steadfastly love the sin bearer, Jesus. God's king trusts in his heavenly father's rescue. God's king trusts in his heavenly father's resurrection from the dead, where Jesus would soon be placed back on his royal throne. And so the psalm goes from weeping in the first half to worship in the second half. Isn't that the story of our suffering, either in this life or the life to come? So I said at the start that these were the last words of the king before his death, but we know that these were not the last words that he ever spoke, don't we? Listen to him leading our sung praises in verse 22. The king says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. And again, verse 25. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. See, the fitting response to God's victory is to burst into the song of the king as we glorify the Lord together. We need not wonder if what the appropriate or correct response is to everything that we have seen this morning. We need not wonder if what the correct or appropriate response is to everything that our King Jesus has done for us on the cross. As our King, as our representative before God, as our priest, he performs his vows by leading us all to sing, to sing to one another, See, our response to Psalm 22 is certainly personal gratitude, but what's even more clear in the psalm is the corporate gratitude that we should express to one another, with one another, for everything that the Lord has done for us through his King. His praises, the song of his salvation for us here in St. Andrews and across the world, that is the soundtrack of our lives. Neither God the Father nor our King Jesus ask us to pay them back for what they have done for us. Instead, what they ask for is our trust, our loyalty, to sing his words, to sing the gospel, to sing his praises, not in a way that insensitively drowns out the desertion, derision, defeat we might sense in this world, not in a way that sticks our fingers in our ears and pretends that it's not happening and it's not real, 
but in a way that lovingly and powerfully reminds us of what we know to be true, what Jesus knew to be true, because God has told us that it is true and shown us that it's true throughout history. Singing to one another in this way is one of the ways that our Lord shepherds our hearts. It's one of the ways that he teaches and reteaches his people of his salvation. One of the ways in which he softens our hard-heartedness. One of the ways in which he reminds us of his power, reminds us of his goodness. But it's not just here among God's people that this song is to be heard. See, the resurrected king leads his people in singing his praises before then leading the nations in singing his praises. Verse 27, look with me. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Why and how will that happen? Well, because, verse 28, kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. See, King Jesus was rescued for resurrection victory, victory, not just to rule his people, but to rule the nations. The world, all of the forces that oppose God and his king, are commanded, invited by him to join in the song. From the bulls of Bashan to the dogs and evildoers that pierced his hands and his feet, Jesus says, sing along. His judgment is clear on his enemies. That was you, that was me at one point before we trusted in Jesus. But his gospel invitation to the nations that he will one day rule is clear in these closing verses. And so wonderfully, regardless of who we are, those who scorned King Jesus can sing along with King Jesus. those who have attempted to blot the Lord's king out of history, God's response to them is to turn up the volume on the praises of his people. So loudly that the song radiates out wider and wider to the ends of the earth. And so as his people, your gospel joy and mine this morning, in response to everything we've seen in Psalm 22, in response to Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, in response to all that he went through, and all the glory that he will have and take. Our response is to take that wonderful good news and sing it to the ends of the earth. To the prosperous of the earth, verse 29, to this generation and the next, verse 30. All of us shall come and proclaim his righteousness. And what is our song? Our song is the last words of the verse, 31 there. He has done it. It is finished. Let me pray for us now before we sing in response to what we've heard this morning. Father, we lament the sin in our lives and in our hearts that led to Jesus dying on the cross in our place. And yet we are so thankful and full of joy and appreciation and gratitude for what he has done for us. King Jesus, we love you. We thank you for dying in our place. Please help us and shape us to live under your rule, to obey you, and to sing to one another, to sing of your goodness. Father, we pray that you would help us not just to sing to one another, as important as that is, but to take this wonderful song, the song of forgiveness and salvation, the song that you have done it to the nations. Please equip us and strengthen us with everything that we need, even in our darkest moments, even when we do not feel like singing. Give us the strength that we need to appropriately, given our circumstances, sing along with Jesus to one another, to the world. In his name we ask. Amen.
where we are going to finish by singing. And that's one of the reasons why.